Welcome back. This is Way In Two Sessions, our special program from inside the Great Hall of the People. Tourism and retail are the two biggest contributors to Hong Kong's economy, but they were hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic and months of often violent protests. The economy, which is already in recession, suffered its worst contraction on record in the first three months of this year, and its unemployment rate rose to the highest in more than a decade in the February to April period. With the pandemic on the one hand, and there's also the uncertainty of the upcoming Legislative Council election, where is Hong Kong's future heading for? I talked to Henry Tang Ying-Nian, a CPPCC Standing Committee member, and he's also the chairman of the board with the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority in Hong Kong. Take a listen. Mr. Tan, if I could, asking your thoughts about the one country, two system principle again. Since there are a lot of things yes. happening since last time we talked, and the four sessions certainly also give us some new inspirations and thinking. What do you personally make of it? Under the one country, two system, we, we love, we love the, our motherland, and we are very, we are, most of the people in Hong Kong are, are patriotic. So there's no doubt that under one country, that we are and we can enjoy the advantages of two system where we have a uh, convertible currency we have an open and free society we have an independent judiciary and these aspects have placed hong kong uh, in a very very important strategic position both financially as well as uh, economically so i have no doubt the one country two system is the best way forward uh, for hong kong secondly I have every confidence that the Central People's Government uh, will, uh, will also believe that the one country, two system is the best way forward for Hong Kong, and they will adhere to the uh, principle of the one country, two system. Thirdly, uh, we, we have returned to the motherland for nearly 23 years, and it has been very, uh, not, it has not been completely uh, uh, trouble free. Together with the Central People's Government, we must be able to stand firm on our belief of the one country, two system. We must be able to, uh, to formulate policies that are beneficial to both Hong Kong and to the uh, Central People's Government. So the People's Republic of China with Hong Kong and Macau as its two systems will be able to take the best advantage of this strategic development. So I have no doubt this constitutional arrangement is the best one for Hong Kong. And also, I have no doubt this constitutional arrangement is also a system where the Central People's Government will adhere to strictly. There are certain aspects of the basic law which we have not been able to complete. For example, the Article 23 of the basic law we have made run one attempt in the year 2003. We failed to gain majority at the Legislative Council. Uh, it, this is an aspect where the security of the country, so therefore, I believe it is something where we will have to, uh, where we will have to uh, complete our, our responsibility under the basic law. Actually, there are several layers of challenges. Earlier, we already see unilateralism, you know, nationalism, and also anti-globalizing trend. Later, there's the pandemic. There is also the China-U.S. trade war. And now we see, uh, you know, China, when it's rising, it is uh, inviting different kind of opinions from different parts of the world. Uh, so how do you think out of this quite complex and intertwined factors, Hong Kong can work with the motherland to brave the storm. I believe this pandemic is, a, is going to cause quite a lot of nationalism and also more unilateralism than in the past. It is understandable that many countries will want to pursue that path because the economies globally is going to take a very, very severe hit, probably the most severe hit that 
any one of us have ever seen in our life lifetimes. The reason I say that is because if you put a sudden stop to the economy for weeks at a time or months at a time, it will cause the disruption of the supply lines, cause disruption of many of the manufacturing industries. It will cause disruption to many of the economic activities that all communities rely on in a globalized economy. So governments always will have the first priority is how to take care of their own people. But I think if I look ahead, I believe the globalization have caused the economies all over the world to be inter interlinked and mutually reliable upon each other. They will leverage that their own strength to do uh, what they do best in order to service not just their own community, but to serve the whole world. So therefore, that's why many of the supply chains are very globalized. And many of the uh, companies, whether they are in America, Europe, China, Russia, uh, South America, or other parts of the world, will not be able to survive uh, just if they completely lock their borders because each nation cannot be a, an island anymore. So looking ahead, I think they will eventually come to realize that while they, it's right to care for its own people first, the resources should be put to help their own people. But overall, it will still be important. Uh, and I think they'll come to realize that they cannot live alone. They're not, they're not alone in this world. And so therefore, uh, the globalization process uh, will still have to continue as, as, they try to, uh, uh, as they try to restart their economies. Talking about COVID-19, what is your assessment of Hong Kong's been dealing with it and the current set of challenges as uh, you've been having quite a few weeks of peace, quote unquote, uh, from the pandemic? First of all, Hong Kong has accumulated quite a lot of experience in dealing with epidemics. Uh, the swine flu, the H1N1 swine flu that started in uh, North America somewhere uh, in 2009, and also multiple times of avian flu uh, in between all that. Uh, we have uh, taken advantage of that experience and a lot of the know-how that we have we have, uh, we have gained, and also we have uh, taken a very aggressive approach in contact tracing. And thirdly, we have, not, we have not locked down the city. And I think that's a very important aspect. We have controlled many uh, uh, social distancing rules, such as uh, no gathering of four people, or then later on we relax to eight. And then we close down bars and a, a number of uh, high risk areas. But overall, I think uh, most of the people are able to go about their lives and uh, uh, go about whatever they, uh, in the, the daily shopping and things like that, to the market, to the supermarket. But looking ahead, uh, while we have done a pretty good job at controlling uh, COVID-19 here, I think, uh, we are beginning to see uh, the, uh, the re-emergence of social disruption, social uh, unrest, and that is very worrying. Mm. And Mr. Tang, let me, before going to the social unrest, uh, asking you about what about the last year's combination of both the social unrest and then dampening effect of COVID-19 on the economy of Hong Kong. Uh, what does that mean, do you think, uh, for the coming year starting from now for Hong Kong? Many of the work routines have been disrupted because of it. So our economy was already suffering under social, un uh, social unrest. And then come COVID-19 with the pandemic, our, our already struggling economy took another beating. So that's like a double whammy blow. Uh, and I'm sure it will do severe damage to our economy. So our biggest challenge 
is of course uh, on how to revive our economy. Uh, and then, but we have also other challenges like the, the social divide that uh, social unrest have uh, have created and has been uh, has been uh, exacerbated and have worsened along the time. Only a few months uh, from the Legislative Council election. Now, earlier last year, we have seen the local election uh, in the districts. The results uh, reflect a certain degrees of uh, unsatisfaction the public has uh, toward the administration. How do you think officials should work and how do you think the Legislative Council election is likely to proceed five months from now? The District Council, the local, uh, local Council elections were held in November of 2019 amid the social unrest. And uh, in all the social unrest, uh, all the all the months that leading that leading up to it, I think a lot of people are uh, uh, were dissatisfied with the Hong Kong SAR government, and they have expressed that dissatisfaction with their with their votes. So they have voted for a lot of the pan democratic uh, members of the opposition, and because the system is first past the post, a simple majority will take the seat. Therefore, the uh, the opposition have gained a lot of uh, district council seats. I would say that they have not been doing a very good job in working for the community. And they have been trying to politicize the district council, which should primarily focus on the works of the local uh, district that they are elected from. And they are supposed to serve the whole community and not just those who they, they believe they have, that, uh, have voted for them. So that's one. Now, looking forward, we are going to have legislative council election in September of 2020, which is only about, uh, only about three and a half months away. So uh, I am, of course, very concerned that this dissatisfaction is going to carry over from, from the last social unrest, and especially now with more activity, our social unrest in the industries now just beginning to see, I, I believe the opposition is trying, is trying to galvanize the community and remind them of the social unrest before and ask them to continue with their, with their futile efforts to, to uh, take over the uh, government as well as the legislative council. Their next target is to gain uh, control of the legislative council I believe our, uh, the, uh, the patriotic members of the Legislative Council and the community is going to, it will, will have to work very, very hard in order not to allow them to do that. Talking about working very hard, Mr. Tan, I know you are involved in an organization which is called the Hong Kong Coalition. And I've been reading about the manifesto coming from this organization. It's opposed to the street violence and also would urge citizens to unite to revive the coronavirus hit economy. And also it's been talking about Hong Kong at a crossroad. Now, how much do you think an organization like this will be able to play its role in a very uh, devastating situation, shall I say, as a result of the political divide in Hong Kong? Now, the government has been promoting a lot of initiatives, such as how to uh, uh, sub uh, subsidizing companies to uh, not to cut any of, of their employees, uh, to subsidize many of the businesses and uh, to overcome that this period where they have been shut down, so on and so forth. So the government has been doing quite a lot already. But the coalition, the primary goal right now is how to be complementary to what the government has been doing. So therefore, uh, the coalition, uh, although it just formed up very, very recently, so they are now uh, considering and, and discussing uh, what all, all sorts of uh, initiatives on how to uh, complement the Hong Kong SAR government. While we have uh, support from most of the major corporations in Hong Kong, I believe it will have to 
be very careful in its way forward that it will complement the Hong Kong SAR government, it will be effective and it will help those who really need help. Pandemics have added a severe blow to our economy. So there will, we are seeing uh, rising unemployment, we are seeing more businesses close down, we are seeing more vacant uh, office, office space and seeing more vacant retail space. So I believe the biggest victim of social unrest as well as the pandemic has been the economy. So it is, it has to be our primary concern going forward.